Okay, well, thank you for joining us. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you on this uh, beautiful evening. It's been a beautiful day too. Okay, so as uh, David has already said, the title of tonight's ministry is Messiah and the Feast of Pentecost. And uh, I just want to begin by, by saying really, although you know, all across our land and, and across the world, churches will be will be celebrating Pentecost Sunday tomorrow. Actually, we should be aware that if you were speaking to Jews, the Jews at this present time are celebrating Shavuot. Now, the reason for that is the Hebrew word um, Shavuot comes from the word Shava, which is the word for seven, we would translate it as seven, and also week. So Shavuot is the plural of Shava, and which means week. So actually, it would be more correct to address it as the feast of weeks. The Pentecost comes from the Greek. But okay, so tonight anything can happen. I may refer to it as Pentecost. I may refer to it as Shavuot or weeks. So just so that you're aware. So just as we get into the scriptures, let's just have a, a word of prayer. So Heavenly Father, we just we come now in the name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, we come with hearts that are open, hearts that are hungry, Lord, to, to feast upon your word tonight. And once again, we're just praying that Holy Spirit, you would open the eyes of our understanding. That we might know you, that we might encounter you through your word, that we might marvel at the wonderful things that you have done for us in your son. Lord, teach us your ways tonight, we pray. Help us to apply what we learn. And we ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well. I think most of you, your seasoned Bible students or even scholars amongst us, and you, you well know that we associate the Feast of Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we can read about in the book of Acts. And we're going to talk about that tonight, but I want to begin by laying a foundation in what we refer to as the, the Old Testament. So, if you would, or if you want to follow just on the screen, we'll find our foundational text in Leviticus chapter 23 and verses 15 through to 21. And I think, let me just see if I can just, there we go. Okay. So Leviticus 23, 15 to 21. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull and two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats as a sin offering and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice of a peace offering. Uh, yes. OK, so. So let's just pause for a moment and think about that. I know we tend to read these passages in Leviticus. And it, it gets quite tedious sometimes when we're looking at all of the details and we're thinking about the, the sacrifices and, and really just praising God that we don't need to bring 
those kinds of sacrifices to the temple in Jerusalem anymore, or the tabernacle, as the case may be. In fact, you would have a, a great difficulty in doing so because there is no temple standing in Jerusalem at this point in time. But the fact is that everything in God's word is important. All of the details are so important. And we're going to think about some of the details in that specific description shortly. But when we think about the Feast of Shavuot or the Feast of Pentecost, we need to understand that it, it, it is a part of the one of the three main pilgrim feasts that the people of Israel, principally the males, they had to they had to keep. So from Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 16, the Lord says, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord, your God, in the place which he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty handed. Now, what's wonderful about this, this whole Jewish calendar, I believe that God reveals something of his, of his plan, his, his salvific plan for humanity through the whole Hebrew calendar. And it's a fascinating study. It's one of the, the first studies that I ever undertook when I came to the Lord. And uh, and just to just to think that God would communicate to us through the land. And through the the cycles, the agricultural cycles of the land, we know that they're an agrarian society. We know that many of Jesus teachings refer to that agricultural cycle within the land. So I want to encourage you really. To, to undertake your own study of Israel's agricultural year and some of the, the prophetic significance of these particular feasts. It wasn't just that, you know, the Lord wanted these people to bring these sacrifices before him. The Lord was teaching them something. And I think we need to bear in mind as we look at the, the whole of the agricultural cycle in the land, we see that he is the Lord of the land. Praise God. These people needed to, they needed to be faithful to what they were taught. But also they needed to depend completely upon the Lord. Not just when they were going through the wilderness wanderings for the miraculous provision of the Lord. But when they came into the land, they would need to depend upon the Lord for the, the early rains for the latter rains and for the harvests. And so we can see here early on, we see what we refer to as the spring feasts, okay? The Passover and unleavened bread. We know also Pentecost, which is really the, the, the early summer. And then later, we come across other other um, um, specific feasts that are mentioned. There are actually seven in total biblical feasts. The trumpets, atonements, tabernacles, uh, and the last great day of the tabernacles, which is something else we can talk about maybe on another occasion. Anyway, we can see that we're referring to the month of, of May here. And we see on this particular chart that it is the beginning of the wheat harvest. And so really what I want us to do right now is just to, to think about the connection between these early feasts. So we know, and we're well acquainted with the, the feast of Passover, which takes place on the 14th day of the month of Nisan. And we know that for, for Israel, this is the, the beginning, really, of months. This is the beginning of their redemption. This speaks to us about the, the death of the Passover lamb that we know was fulfilled in Jesus, our Passover lamb. And, of course, the way that the Lord acted to bring out his people from the slavery of Egypt by the substitutionary sacrifice of a lamb. And they were told that they were to spread the, the uh, uh, blood upon the doorposts 
and upon the lintels. And the promise was that when the Lord saw the blood, that that, that curse, that, that plague of death would pass over them. And we know that it was the beginning of their exodus when they were being redeemed from slavery. But there's another part of this particular feast that I want to I think about for a moment, and it is the day of first fruits, and it's mentioned in Leviticus 23, but we rarely think about it. You see, most of us, we know that the, the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that the, the, the festival of Passover was fulfilled really through the death of Christ, who, who is the Lamb of God. But we're told that on the morrow after the Sabbath, the Passover Sabbath, that there was to be an offering of the first fruits of the harvest of the land. And that would be referring to the barley harvest. The barley was the first to, to ripen. And so that, would, that was also the food of the poor, incidentally. And, uh, and it's interesting that on the morning after the Sabbath that we know, was the morning in which the Lord Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. That on that same morning, the priest was in the temple presenting the first fruits of the barley harvest. Now, I find that quite remarkable. And I've got no, no evidence for this, but I wouldn't be surprised if at the same time that the Lord Jesus was rising from the dead on that early morning that the priest wasn't in the temple presenting that first sheaf that first fruits of the barley harvest and so we know that jesus he is the first fruits of the resurrection and we'll talk about that a little more shortly but then we come to what we know as pentecost and again, just going back into the scriptures to Leviticus 23 and verse, let me see, uh, 15, he says, and you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. And so you can see, it's interesting, there is no date here. We can see that it's inextricably linked with the, the festival of Passover and the day of the first fruits. And I think that speaks, it speaks so much into the, the connection, the the absolute significance of the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ with the coming of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus made it very clear that unless he departed, unless he went away, that the spirit of truth would not come. But that if he went away, then the spirit of truth would come and lead us into all truth. So I think that is a, a, a very significant fact in this whole this whole setup, this whole program. So thinking about the Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, in the mind of the Jews, it is Jewish tradition that it was on the, the Feast of Weeks that, that the Shavuot, that the Torah, that the, the law was given at Mount Sinai. So let's just think about that for a moment. And that's based on Exodus chapter 19 and, and tradition. But I think that's quite significant. And the Apostle Paul teaches about this. So let's think the people of Israel, they leave the, the, the slavery of Egypt. But that wasn't the end goal. The end goal was to bring them to Mount Sinai. And so at Mount, Mount Sinai, the, the reproach had been rolled away. Now they were being formed into God's people, so to speak, being organized and given God's instruction. In fact, we often interpret Torah as law, which carries quite negative connotations. And, and it's true. There is a sense in which it's negative for us because of the problem with humanity. But actually, perhaps a, a more accurate translation would be instruction. 
And so God was given his instruction for life to his people at Mount Sinai. But let's just look at the words of the Apostle Paul here as he describes what happened on Mount Sinai. Let's think about some of the wording. He says, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. Lots of talk of glory there. But notice how he, he describes it as the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. Though it was a glorious thing, the giving of the Torah, and you can read all about what happened at Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus around chapter 30 onwards. And we can see that the, the, there was a great earthquake, great noises and, and fire, and it must have been awesome to behold. It was indeed glorious. And we know that the, the law of God is glorious, is wonderful, it's beautiful. Everything that comes from God is beautiful. The issue is not with the law. The issue is with humanity. And the issue is that the law did not have the capacity to bring about the changes that needed to take place within the human heart. But God had a different plan. When we read the account of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, it's, it's a tragic account. And we remember that as Moses goes up onto Mount Sinai to re receive the, the law, the commandments of God. We're told in the scriptures how there is a rebellion at the foot of Mount Sinai. It's quite it's unbelievable, isn't it, to think that that would be happening. But we, we hear about the rebellion of the, the golden calf, where the people want Aaron to, to make gods that will lead them through the, the wilderness. And obviously they're thinking back to the gods that they would have known back in Egypt. And so uh, um, Aaron, he falls for this and, and there is a rebellion and there is immorality and idolatry. God is aware of it, obviously. He makes Moses aware of it. And Moses comes down the mountain outraged. And we know that he breaks the original tablets of the law. But it doesn't stop there. In Exodus 32, verses 26 to 28, the scriptures say, Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3000 men of the people fell that day. What a tragedy. And so we can see it. And again, it's interesting. And that the Apostle Paul, when he refers to, you know, the giving of the law that was engraved upon stone, it, it, it was a ministry of death and condemnation. Again, just to reiterate, not because there was anything wrong with the law, because there was problem with a human heart, with human nature. And that was being clearly demonstrated at the foot of Mount Sinai. Can you believe that? And so we see that that ministry, in effect, it brings death because of the rebellion of these people note the number of people and about 3000 men of the people fell that day that's quite a slaughter so just bear that in mind as we now move into the new testament and we think about what we celebrate within our churches and again i encourage you to read the the whole of the passage um when you can so let's just read the first four verses i'm sure you've read this many times 
when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were seated. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, and one sat up on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What a glorious day that was. But you can see again when the day of Pentecost, when the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, had fully come. And now we know how it had fully come. They had counted the 50 days. And on the 50th day, they were to celebrate the day of Pentecost, Shavuot. And we know that there were Jews from many different places that were present in that place at that time, as well as the disciples. The disciples had previously been told to, to tarry in Jerusalem and to wait for the promise of the Father, for the promised Holy Spirit. And they were told that they would receive power from on high. And that they would be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I think, you know, that speaks volumes to us. That we also, we're so dependent upon the Holy Spirit. That we might be effective witnesses today. And so the day of Pentecost had fully come. Notice also, uh, I, again, I encourage you to read some of the scriptures uh, that describe what went on in Mount Sinai. You know, the, the, the earthquake, the sounds, you know, the, 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 the fire and so on. It's quite interesting that we see some of these things appearing again in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And now we're told that the, the disciples, Peter in particular, preaches a sermon on that day. And note Acts 2 verses 40 to 41. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, notice, about 3000 souls were added to them. And I, I, I think that's so wonderful. That as we've already seen, when the when the law was given at Mount Sinai because of the rebellion of the human heart, that around 3000 men were put to the sword, were put to death. And, and, and there was death and there was condemnation on that day. But on this day, on the day of Pentecost, on Shavuot, we see about 3000 souls that are added to the church through the preaching, through the effective witness of the apostles, the preaching of the apostle Peter and so on. And, and, and uh, again, this is so wonderful, friends. If we think about the, the relationship between the law and the spirit. Interesting that Jesus said, you know, he did not come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. And as we read through the Sermon on the Mount, we can see that he actually raises the bar of righteousness. And I, I don't know about you, but when I'm reading those particular passages, I soon realize that, that of myself, it's impossible. That actually we need help. We need help. And it is the Holy Spirit of God who will enable us not just to be effective witnesses, to be, to, but to be walking in obedience. Praise God, these 3,000 souls, they understood the message that day. And the reason they understood it is because the Holy Spirit of God enabled them to understand it. And they became a part of the ecclesia, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I also believe that many of these went away to their home homelands and and planted churches it's quite possible that those who were present on the day of pentecost were the same people who planted the church in rome it's a possibility 
But again, let's just stop for a moment. We, we've understood about the, the day of Pentecost. We've thought about the coming of the law on Mount Sinai. We've thought about the coming of the Spirit. Let's think for a moment about this special offering. Because at the end of the day, it was a thank offering. The people of Israel were to bring a thank offering for all of the, the first fruits. So the, the, the counting of the over, the counting of the days had taken place and that arrived at the, the day of Pentecost. And they were bringing in, they could bring in uh, uh, various types of, of their first fruits. The Bible mentions seven sacred species. I've written them down here, so don't forget. But barley, wheat, pomegranates, grapes, figs, olives, dates. So you can imagine Jerusalem at that time. The cacophony of sound. You can imagine the multitudes coming up to Jerusalem to bring their first fruits to the house of the Lord, to give him thanks for his provision. Imagine the singing that was taking place. I, I, I love to imagine these things. And uh, as they were walking up to Jerusalem, singing uh, psalms like the Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. But again, I said the details are very important. And so let's just remind ourselves of Leviticus 23, verse 17. The Lord said, you shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. Now, this is interesting. The fact that there are two wave loaves, but also the fact that they are baked with leaven. And if you just cast your minds back to the feast of Passover, the feast of Passover would be followed by the feast of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is an important part of that particular uh, uh, feast. Now, we know as we read through the New Testament that very often leaven represents sin. Jesus, for example, I believe it's Matthew chapter 16, warned the disciples to be wary of, of the leaven of the Pharisees. And there are many other places where leaven represents sin. So let's just bear that in mind for a moment. What could possibly be happening? Well, we've talked about the, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. We've talked about the fact that these, these first converts, these first fruits of the harvest of souls that were to come into the kingdom uh, uh, were, were empowered to become effective witnesses. And as we read through the book of Acts, we can see how they went out into their homelands and they went, the apostles went out and, the, 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 you know, the, the gospel is being preached and across the Gentile world also. You start to read about this outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. We see in Acts chapter 10, for example, where the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the upon Cornelius and his household. Acts chapter 10. And so we see suddenly not only are Jews receiving this wonderful gift, the promise of the Father, that they received on the day of Pentecost. And so many other Jews being converted and receiving the Holy Spirit. But we see that it is a gift, not just for Jews, but for Greeks, for Gentiles, for non-Jews. And that would cause some confusion amongst the Jewish Christians, the early Jewish Christians. You can read about some of that in Acts chapter 15. But the fact is, we know that with the passage of time, that, you know, the church became predominantly Gentile. And so it's very interesting that when, when, when God was telling the priest to bring these wave offering before the Lord, these two loaves, that these two loaves, they were, they were baked with, with leaven. And if we think about the, what that represented, that there was still sin. Now, that's different from Christ, the first fruits who had no leaven, who had no sin. But here, let me suggest to you, we have a representation, we have a type or a, a figure 
of what God was doing by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what he was doing. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and 13, for as the body is one, uh, is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body. Uh, let me just move that. So also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves being made to drink into one spirit. Elsewhere, he says, Ephesians chapter three, verse three to seven, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Now note that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And that's wonderful. When, when he talks about mystery, we need to understand. We're not talking about a Sherlock Holmes mystery here. But he defines what he means by a mystery in the New Testament. He says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So what was that mystery? That mystery is that Gentiles would, would be fellow heirs of the same body. And, and receive of the same promise in Christ through the gospel. This is one of the, the, the great mysteries within the New Testament. Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. Praise God. Praise God. Note, please note. And this is, I think, quite tragic that, you know, the, the, the scriptures, I do not believe the scriptures teach that the, that the church in any way uh, um, replaces Israel. That God has a specific plan and a purpose for Israel. And I believe if you read Romans chapter 9 through 11, you'll see that. He's not finished with Israel. He's made it quite clear with that. But right now, at this point in God's plan of salvation for humanity, we have Jews. And we have Gentiles that have become one in Messiah, baptized by one spirit into one body, into Christ. That's wonderful. Let me just read you another, another passage here in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, he says in verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, there, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to those who were near, for through him, we both have access by one spirit to the father. Again, wonderful truth, wonderful truth. He says that the middle wall of, wall of separation has been broken down. It's quite possible that the apostle Paul here is referring to a specific wall within the, com the temple complex, the temple courts. It was a known, known as the, the Soreg, and it, it defined the limits for non-Jews to approach the temple of the Lord. And so there's that distinction that existed. But now we're told that that, that that middle wall of separation has been broken down. Praise God. And the Jew and Gentile have become one in Messiah. That is a work of the spirit, the same spirit that was poured out on the day of Pentecost, on the feast of weeks hallelujah so not only had not only has he he made one new man of jew and gentile but the bible also says that he's established a new covenant and when the bible talks about a new covenant we should think about the words of the prophet jeremiah in chapter 31 and verse 33 let's just remind ourselves of that 
But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Praise God. And so once again, we, we can remind ourselves that the, the issue is never the law. The law is good and holy and righteous. The, but God spoke of a new covenant they would establish whereby he would change the hearts of people. And he says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. It will no longer be on stone, so to speak, and bring condemnation. But I'll actually write it upon their hearts. Friend, this can be no, no other than conversion. And that's exactly what he's done, not just with Jews, but also with Gentiles like you and I. And I believe that. Yes, there are Jews that are entering this now and they are experiencing the new covenant now. In fact, if you go to the land of Israel, you see like never before so many Jews that are turning back to to the Lord and understanding that Christ Jesus is their Messiah. And as they do, the Lord writes upon their hearts the, the, the laws and upon their minds. But I believe that one day. And again, I, I would point to Romans 11, chapter, uh, verse 26, 27, that speaks about this. One day there will be a turning, and the, uh, Paul describes them as all Israel, and he says all Israel shall be saved. Again, the, the, the identity of the all Israel is open to some discussion, and maybe it's for another, another time. But I believe there will come a, a generation, a generation that will turn. A generation that will witness the coming, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there will be a, a great outpouring on that day. And we will see the fullness of this promise on that day. It's quite interesting that at this particular time in Shavuot, the Jews read through the book of Ruth. And if we think about what we've just talked about, Jew and Gentile. One in Messiah. You know, as we read and, and through the book of Ruth, we're, we're told about how this Moabites. And again, I encourage you to, to look up the scriptures and to see what the Lord said about the Moabites. But this particular Moabites, how she abandons her people, she abandons her land. To be faithful to Naomi and to return to the promised land. And she says these words, she says, your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And I think those words, they are significant for us today as Gentiles, that we have also, we've become sons of, of Abraham, children of Abraham through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we seek and we, we love and we worship the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We're not called to become Jews. But we're called to become one with them in Messiah. And so may we say with conviction, your people shall be my people and your God, the God of Israel, my God. And so as we come to the, the final part of this particular study, and it is just a, an introduction, really. Let's think about the prophetic significance. Concerning the future. And we need to be very careful here, but I just want to I want to just point something out. Some of the language that we find in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 to 23. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. <clears throat> and again, I find this quite fascinating. If we think about the, the feasts, remember, at the beginning, we talked about the Passover. And then we talked about the feast or the day of first fruits, the morrow after the Sabbath. And we, we, we heard how Christ 
was really fulfilling all of the typology within that 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 day of first fruits when the priest would be entering into the temple and he would be pre presenting the, the first sheep of the barley harvest on the day when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and we're told here Christ the first fruits afterward those who are Christ at his coming and again it's interesting that the scriptures through the scriptures the Lord instructs his people to count the days from the day of the first fruits offering the day that Jesus was resurrected until the day of Shavuot, the, 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 the seven sevens, and the 50th day being the day of Pentecost. Could it be that we have a, a type here? Is, is the Lord showing us that, that actually, you know, this is kind of representing the church age? And what we know that on that day that the, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost and the first fruits of the church came in, but could it be also pointing to? The day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns from heaven to receive the church, to rapture the church before the tribulation period. I'll, I'll leave that with you because actually only time will tell, right? But just a reminder of the promise. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And that friends is our blessed hope. Praise God. Praise God. And so just to finish again, this is, this is just an introduction. There is so much more that can be said, and I'm sure that if you if you undertake your own study, you can go into so much more depth. And it's a wonderful study, the typology within the feasts. But just to remind ourselves that the feast of Passover speaks of the first coming of the Lord, the fact that he came and he came to to pay the price for us, that we might know redemption, that we might know forgiveness. We know the Feast of Tabernacles usually. We speak about the Feast of Tabernacles and how the Feast of Tabernacles speaks about the, the return of the Messiah, the return of Jesus to establish his kingdom in the earth. And we, we describe that as the millennial kingdom, the 1,000 year reign of Christ in the earth. But very often we, we skip the Feast of Week Shavuot. And again, after all that we've said to, to, tonight and what we've looked at tonight of how it reminds us of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's in fulfillment of the prophecies. Joel prophesied about that, but also how those two wave loaves, how they in some way they speak to us of the Jew and Gentile, one in the church, one in Messiah. But also how it could be speaking about the fact that one day the Lord Jesus Christ will return to receive the church and to take us out of this earth before the beginning of tribulation again time will tell but i just want to to leave you with that and encourage you to go on and undertake your your own studies i trust this has encouraged you and and blessed you and uh, may the holy spirit just just guide you in your own walk in your own study of this wonderful subject so may god bless you so i'm going to end with prayer let me just bring this up here. Uh, okay. Let's just have a word of prayer. Father, we just want to say thank you for your son. Thank you, Lord, for your beautiful plan of salvation. And thank you. Lord, that you've, you've spoken to us through types and through shadows that are wonderfully fulfilled in our Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, tonight, as we've just looked at this, this wonderful feast and really just skimmed the surface, but there's so much more I know, Holy Spirit, that you could show. I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord. Lord, that it's just wet their appetite to go away and to, to dig deeper. 
And I pray that, Lord, you'll lead them on their own journey, Father, of revelation, of discovery. Lord, that will bless them, that will encourage them and cause them to grow, Lord, and, and be established all the more. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, on that day and on, on Shavuot, Lord, we're giving thanks for your provision. All that you provided, Lord, we want to honor you and give you praise. And so now I pray your blessing and your protection upon all those who have tuned in tonight, Lord, to participate. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.